Hi everyone, Lady Rose here with you today. It is a nice, beautiful, hot, and very humid day here in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. But luckily, I'm very thankful because I have an air conditioning coming today. So it will make for a more pleasant summer this year, I'm sure. But enough about me. I'm here to talk about you, to pose some questions to you, to share some knowledge, and hopefully make your day a little bit better. And perhaps even your life. Who knows? So I'm going to put a question out there. And the question is, what would you do if you knew you absolutely could not fail? Or put another way, what would you do if you knew success was guaranteed? If success was guaranteed, what would you do? Now, some of you might be excited by that question. What would I do? Oh my gosh, what is my dream? You know, let's make some plans. What would I do? Yes, okay, let's, how do I get into that mindset of success, of guaranteeing my own success? Because we often, you've probably heard, our thoughts become a reality, right? So where are your thoughts going? In particular with this question, this can be a little bit of a test question. Now, some of you might be scared and go, what would I do? I don't know. I can't think. I can't, well, you can think, but I can't make that decision. It seems so daunting because the possibilities are endless. And you're right. The possibilities are endless. So it can seem very daunting to have that big question posed to you. Now, some of you may be jaded as well. Some of you maybe have gone to some of the workshops and conferences and seminars and things and have heard this question before and you got lots of buzzwords from the conference and you left feeling great and you got home and you went, so what tools do I now have to use this, you know, to make this question a success for me? What would I do if I knew I couldn't fail? What would I do if I knew success was guaranteed? So they often leave you with the questions, but don't always give you the tools to answer those questions. So as myself, I'm living a very dream life now. I've gone through some hard lessons and I have a toolbox full of tools that I can draw upon that I'm very much aware of now. Part of it is because I'm a certified life purpose and life coach. So I do what I call happiness life purpose sessions. And in these sessions, you can talk about any area of your life. Nothing's out of bounds to make your life better, to make it more fulfilling, to add substance or to give direction to your life. Because a lot of us live on autopilot. But I wanted to talk a little bit about doubt and worry because sometimes when we get posed that question and we come up with something that we would like to do and it's like, okay, yeah, but then that little, you know, voice comes in and it's saying, oh, I don't know, you know, and we get into the doubt and worry and our conscious mind can get addicted to that, get addicted to the doubt and worry. And a lot of times we um, automatically go to those places and we disguise it as things like rational thinking or logical thinking or being cautious um, in a good way. I'm keeping myself safe, you know, and you are, but at the same time, you came in here with a purpose. So before we came into this lifetime, we had a plan. Each and every one of us came in with a plan. None of us came in here to fly by the seat of our pants. <laughs> we all came with a purpose. And we let the powers that be know that purpose. So things like our spirit guides and our guardian angels and even the universe sometimes tip us certain ways knowing the promises that we made before we came here. So I'm also a tarot reader and an astrologist. So when I do a birth chart, um, as it's more commonly known, I actually call it your birth promises. So when you're doing your birth promises, or when I'm doing a birth chart, I'm showing you the promises and some of the contracts, often called the sacred contracts, that you made before coming into this life about what your plan is with this life. 
So if you know astrology, you know it's a big circle is your birth chart. And basically it's a snapshot and a picture of where the stars were when the second you were born. And depending on their positions, certain energies will influence you more strongly and and there's going to be certain like you're going to focus on this house or that house so the pot the circle is divided up like a pie and there's 12 houses so there's 12 sections of pie and each pie is kind of labeled with different things like this first piece is all about you you know what you're like you know what you're going to look like blah blah, blah. you know the fourth piece for instance is all about family What's your family going to look like? What brothers and sisters are? do you want to have? What kind of parents do you want? You know, the eighth house or ninth house, I can't remember which one, but one of, they're about traveling and knowledge. So you pick that one, you go, okay, I want to travel here, I want to travel there because I want to learn this and I want to learn that. Now, you don't always have something in every house, but I kind of compare it to high school where you get to pick your courses and you kind of do that before you move in to this new life. And you say, I wanna pick this course and I wanna pick that course. Now in high school, there are certain courses you have to take, right? Certain credits you have to get. Like you have to get an English credit and maybe there's a math credit you have to get. So, you know, so you pick your English and you pick your math and then from there you've got free reign to do whatever you wanna do as far as what do you wanna gain out of this life. So a lot of us forget that, that we came in here with a specific purpose and a specific plan of what we're going to be doing. We knew where our strengths were or are in this life. We knew where our strengths were going to be from other lives that we've already lived. Like, I'm really good at this and I'm really good at that. And we know that, like this is before we came in. Sometimes when we come in, we have natural, what are deemed natural strengths and gifts, right? Like, say someone can sit down and they can just play the piano. They just know how to do it. It's not, it's not so much that it's a gift. It is definitely a gift, but they may have learned that skill in a past life and they're bringing that forward into this life. So a lot of people who talk about past lives will talk about the baggage that we bring in and the traumas and the hurts and the emotional um, healing that we need to have. Yes, we bring that. And again, humans like to focus on the negative. What we forget is we also bring in our past gifts, our strengths, all that comes with us too. And we can decide to let go of some of the trauma and the hurt before we come into this life if we want. If we don't want to, then we drag it all with us. But our strengths pretty much always follow us. So we came in here knowing that we're good at certain things. Certain, we have a certain skill that just, you know, now comes naturally to us. It's not that we haven't had to go through learning it. We have. We just don't have to learn it in this life because we've already learned it. So we come in here um, knowing what our strengths are and wanting to develop new strengths. Wanting to heal certain areas. So when we bring what they call baggage with us, sometimes we bring that on purpose to know, okay, in this lifetime, I'm finally gonna cut those cords, I'm going to do the healing that needs to be done, and I'm going to let it go by the end of the life or, or you know, going into that next life in the in-between times. We also come in here saying, okay, I'm gonna reach this new level of enlightenment because it's not just, all a physical um, growth that we want to happen. It's mostly a spiritual growth because, you know, as the old saying goes, we're spiritual beings having, having a human experience, not the other way around. Although it's good to have some human, you know, gifts as well and strengths. <laughs> so the other thing that we often will forget is that we have access to all the knowledge that the universe has. And the universe has all the knowledge. <laughs> so we have access to it all. We can tap into it um, because we're part of the universe. We are part of the universe. We're, we are, you know, the divine. We have divine in us. Again, we're spiritual beings and we're all connected. And we have access 
whether it's past history, forward stuff, just general spiritual stuff, whatever it is we want to know about, we have access to it. Now, that being said, it's not like, you know, oh, well, I want to press this button and suddenly know this or suddenly have this strength or have this enlightenment or whatever. There are moments when you have like the aha moments or whatever, but the aha moments for us as humans in our human form are very much like, okay, we've been trying to get there and now we're suddenly there and things click into place. It's like, ah, okay, now I see it. But really the access that we have knowledge to, I compare it to like the biggest library you've ever been in. It's, the universe has all the knowledge, absolutely all the knowledge, even how the universe was started and where what was the first thing, you know, that sort of thing. Has all this knowledge, but it's a huge library. And you have to, first of all, find the book that you want on whatever particular knowledge or strength you're trying to build. And then you have to read the book. <laughs> And so although we have access to all that knowledge, and we do, it's not necessarily instantaneous knowledge. Some of it can be. And we've seen like some of the greatest minds on earth uh, seem to have better access to this particular, to knowledge, right? Like they, 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 sometimes they can think in on levels that it's like, okay, this is blowing my mind kind of thing but they're able to tap into the universe's library. We are too. It's just we maybe have to learn how to do that and learn to not get so wrapped up in our other dramas that are going on. And one of the things that sort of blocks us is doubt and worry. And we can get addicted to doubt and worry because doubt and worry can be a weird sort of um, comfort because our brain knows doubt and worry we know disappointment we know failure we're familiar with those things and we have a fear of failure as well so our brain oftentimes in order to protect us will say well you don't want to do that you know that's that's not where your strong suit is no don't do that because if you do you might you might fail and then you'll look foolish and then, you know, it's going to hurt. <laughs> and yeah, it will hurt if you fall down or look foolish sometimes. And that's part of humor. Humor is very important. And I'm always telling people, when you talk to your angels or ask them for signs, I always say they have a very, very good sense of humor. And they love puns is the other thing. They love puns. But they, they will sometimes give you those signs in very humorous ways and you know you're kind of like oh I see what you did there kind of thing when you finally see it and humor is one of the most healing energies you can get into humor so a lot of times we get to a point where we can't laugh at ourselves and in tarot the deck begins with the fool who is zero and the fool is all of us. The fool is the one that brings um, lightness to any situation because they joke about it and they laugh at it and they have to be able to as an enlightened fool because one fool is not enlightened and one fool is. So the tarot used to have two fools thus the reason the playing card deck today that you play old maid and gin rummy and poker with have two jokers because one of the fools or one of the jokers is the non-enlightened fool and the other one is the enlightened fool. And the enlightened fool knows that he has to learn how to laugh, not only at his situation, but at himself. So this is a mindset, right? And oftentimes we go to a mindset of doubt or worry and it's our brain trying in a backwards way to protect us because we don't want to look foolish. We don't want to be hurt. We, you know, we have a hard time in relationships because we don't want to be vulnerable because we might get hurt because we got hurt once and the brain is just like, yep, nope, shut it down. It's kind of like those people that will eat a at a restaurant 
and maybe they got a little sick from it and you never really know where you get food poisoning from if it was food poisoning so you can't really point the finger but you know it is suspect I ate at this restaurant I got food poisoning blah 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 but it doesn't mean that restaurant serves food poisoning as its menu <laughs> <laughs> you could go back another time and it's fantastic there's no food poisoning you know it's just luck of the draw sometimes but there's people that oh, I got food poisoning there once I would never I would never go there again not ever so we tend to live in a very antidotal way you know or I heard a friend got food poisoning there so I'm not gonna do I'm not gonna eat at that restaurant it's like okay so first of all most restaurants are not serving food poisoning on every diff single meal yes there can be mistakes made and yes it's horrible if it happens to be food poisoning that it has hit you um or it could also be the bad you know bologna sandwich that you ate at lunch as opposed to the dinner you had at the restaurant right um but nevertheless we tend to want to point it to something we want to blame something for when we're hurt and we're hurt physically because if anyone's been food poisoned they know they don't want to do that again i've had food poisoning and it's like yeah that was not a fun ride but at the same time hearing you know i heard this and i heard this happened when this when you did this so i'm never gonna do that and it's like that's a very antidotal way it's not a scientific way of living your life um, it's it's better to test it out, you know, and to know that maybe it's one in a hundred thousand that gets food poisoning from this restaurant. So your friend got food poisoning. So uh, 999,000 or whatever it is, more of you can go there and not get food poisoning. But we always focus on the negative side and it happened once so it can happen again and we're sure it'll happen to us kind of thing. So we create some of these self-fulfilling um, prophecies as well. Like, oh, I'm no good at this. No, I can't do that because I'm, I'm just horrible at it. Well, yeah, you're right. I mean, we've all heard Henry Ford's saying of, if you say you can, you're right. And if you say you can't, you're also right. So our, our thoughts and our words really do create our reality. So be careful of the mindset of where you go when you hear a question like, what would you do if you knew success was guaranteed? And are you living in that antidotal way? Have you heard something happen to someone, so therefore I'm not going to do this because it will happen to me too? And and it that's not true. It probably won't happen to you. So... You know, misery loves company. We love to be in that, yeah, yeah, I know that horrible thing happened to me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, we spread good news too, but the old adage is bad news spreads faster than, than good news. Like when we read a good book, we want to share that with people. When we do eat at a great restaurant, like the food was amazing, you gotta go, you know, kind of thing. Um, but we tend to be in that habit of doubt and worry and we disguise it as being logical and rational and cautious. Now, the other thing I wanted you to think about is that success is your birthright. When you came in here with this plan, your birth promises on your astrology chart, you knew this is where I'm going to be successful and this is where I'm going to be successful, and this is a skill that I'm going to work on and build on. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to be a master of it necessarily by the end of your life, because a lot of skills, you know, again, you know, they're not one and done. If we could sit down at a piano once and just become Beethoven, that would be fantastic, but that's not usually the way it works. A lot of times people have to work for years to become even at the level of Beethoven, right? Beethoven was able to tap into the knowledge of music, but he probably had many past lives building up to that knowledge. So when we start something and we feel like we're failing, a lot of times we'll put breaks on the continuation of that education because learning something new is hard. It hurts. It's hard. It's hard on us physically, emotionally. I don't get this. I don't understand. My brain is exploding. I just, I can't get it. We get all muddled and we just go, I just want to give up. But we came in here saying we're going to learn a new skill. 
even if it's brand new, we might say, yeah, I want to learn this. Or we could be coming in going, well, I've ma managed to master the first level of this skill. So now I want to move on to that next level, sort of like karate, you know, like you start out with the white belt and maybe in this lifetime you go to the yellow belt and next lifetime you go to the green belt, whatever skill set you've decided to work on. So that sort of thing. So a lot of us get frustrated when we don't instantly know how to do stuff at a master level. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of funny. I mean, I'm sure the universe and the angels have a good laugh at us all down here. Um, trying to work out <laughs> our stuff. <laughs> um, but watch out for that failure mindset or that doubt and worry. So there's an analogy I want to you to think about. So when, so a lot of times when we think about, oh, I want to do this, or this is my dream, or this is my goal, a lot of times we'll get um, into that doubt, worry, uh, failure mindset and we'll just maybe put the brakes on it and like I don't know if I can do it and and that sort of thing but it's all about that journey about keeping going forward and a lot of times people will like well I've had this goal or I've had this dream for a very long time and you know I'll do a little bit and then you know I'll put it on the back burner and they'll bring it out front again and I'll put it on the back burner again because it's like oh yeah I'm reminded about how hard this is or you know, how good I'm not good at it, or, you know, like how, how I'm not that good at it kind of thing. But when you get into your car, so this is an analogy, when you get into your car, so this is the car of your goals, okay? This is the, the vehicle that will take you to success. So in real life, when you get into a car and you go to Costco, for instance, you don't doubt that the grocery store is there right? You know, you get, you're getting into your car and you're going to the grocery store to get groceries. So that's kind of like the goal. The goal is the grocery store. And you're putting doubt around the fact that you think the grocery store isn't there, which is your goal, right? So when we put it out there that we want certain things, the universe very rarely says no. In fact, the universe usually says yes. Probably 85% of the time the universe says yes. The other 15, it says, well, yeah, but not in the time that you're thinking or the way you need to take a little side tour over here in order to come here to your goal. But it doesn't usually go, no, you can't have that. <laughs> so we put it out there, we ask for it, and it's as if we're going, okay, so I would really like some groceries. Okay, there you go, here's some groceries. So we get in our car to go get our groceries, but on the way we're going, oh, I don't know, is that grocery store there? Is it there? Is it going to be there? I don't think so. I better turn around and go home because I'm not sure the grocery store is going to be there. But you don't doubt when you're in your everyday life. When you go out to get groceries, you know where the grocery store is, and you have no doubt that Loblaws or Costco or Metro has not been torn down <laughs> in the last few days since you've last been there. And you're not driving and thinking, oh boy, I hope the grocery store is still there. So this is the mindset that we need to kind of address when we're asking for things, when we want to manifest something in. This is the emotion. So this is something we're familiar with, and this is why I'm using this analogy, that we're familiar with getting in the car driving to the car with our list in our hands to go and pick up the milk, the bread, the eggs, the butter, whatever it is we're getting. And we know we just know the grocery store is going to be there so for for us to pick out whatever groceries we need. So this is the mindset that you need to be in when you ask for things, when you want something. Again, what would you do if you knew success was guaranteed? Don't doubt that the grocery store is there. Don't doubt that it will have what you need, what you've asked for. So this is just sort of a bit of an analogy. And knowing that success is not only our plan, but our birthright and our birth promise. And the universe and the angels and our spirit guides knew of these things because we all had a big meeting before we came into this plane of life 
and they went, okay, this is your goal, this is what you wanna do, this is how you wanna fix this problem or heal that problem or you know, get rid of that karma debt or this is what, and this is where you wanna move forward on, this is a skill you wanna develop. All right, we're behind you, 100%. We'll help you every step of the way. Then we get into this life and we quickly forget what our birth promises are. And our angels and our guides are going, oh, remember this over here, look over here, look over here. And you're like, yeah, no, I don't wanna do that. <laughs> so failure is not our birthright and yet we often choose failure with doubt, with worry, with self-fulfilling prophecies of um, saying you can't. And the other thing as humans is we love to be right. So when we say, I can't do this, I can't do this particular thing, I'm no good at it. And then we go to try to do it and we fall down. We go, see, told you I couldn't do it. We love that energy of being right. Even when we do something wrong, even when we are not successful at something because we've predicted it ahead of time. We've told people, I'm no good at this. You know, I'm gonna try, but I don't know, it might not work out. And then when it doesn't work out, oh, see, I called it. I knew it wasn't gonna work out, you know, because you put that doubt, that worry there, and it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that is where we've chosen failure. So when something doesn't work out, and you're about to say, see, I told you it wasn't gonna work out, yeah, in that moment, and even before then, really, you're choosing to fail. You're choosing to fail. It's a big thing to own and to be aware of, to become aware of. You know, like when I'm avoiding things, that's, that's often how I um, choose failure is by avoiding things because I'll just avoid until it hopefully just goes away. <laughs> and there's been a lot of times where I've really had to sit down with myself and say, okay, why are you avoiding this? What's this emotion? What are you feeling? And why are you avoiding it? What, what can we do so that you won't avoid it, right? And so then I ask, I often ask my angels and my spirit guides to help me with this avoidance that I do. And I'm slowly, well, first of all, I'm able to recognize it a lot faster than I did before because I didn't even realize I avoided things. Um, so I love and I'm thankful and grateful that I have the awareness now to know, oh, this is you avoiding stuff and you're choosing failure when you do that. So then now I'm able to now sit down and work my way through that so that even if it's painful, even if it's you know something I really don't want to do, because again, we avoid things that we're not good at, right? We'd rather do stuff we're good at. And that's what's called living in the tail of your dragon, because the tail is where our strengths lie, but the head is where our purpose lies. And a lot of us don't want to go to our head. Um, so we disguise it as rational thinking, as being realistic, of having common sense. Common sense, I know the old saying is common sense isn't as common as you would think, and that's true, but sometimes common sense is disguised as doubt, worry, and failure, and choosing that failure. Not always, but sometimes. Um, when we do this, we are putting what we call the servant first. So there's a saying or there's a quote, not a saying, there's a quote that Albert Einstein said, and he was, if not the greatest, at least in the top five greatest minds that have walked this planet. And what he said was the intuitive mind is a sacred gift. And a lot of us have even squashed down the intuitiveness. So the intuitive mind is a sacred gift. The rational mind is the faithful servant of the intuitive mind. The intuitive mind tends to be our subconscious. Society has conditioned us to honor the servant and dismiss the sacred. So that's something to think about. The intuitive mind, our intuition, 
Our intuitive mind is a sacred gift and we're not giving it the honor that we should. Our rational mind, because it has a place. It's not that, you know, just don't think rationally or logically or, you know, it's good to have common sense in the right areas and the right conditions and that sort of thing. But it's our rational mind that's the faithful servant of our our intuitive mind, the one that just feels things, the one that, you know, just sort of has a knowing and it's not um, necessarily logical kind of thing. But society has conditioned us to doubt, to worry, and to question. And there's nothing wrong with questioning, but we question on this very jaded, logical kind of way, right? And, and it's conditioned us to honor the servant and dismiss the sacred. Because most of what Albert Einstein did was not in a lab. It was thinking. It was just him thinking and this whole quantum, you know, physics and, you know, E equals MC squared came out of his mind, just came out of his mind. He imagined what, how the universe is, you know, functioning, how it unfolds, time and how it works. And, you know, he imagined different forms of time and that he recognized that there's different ways that the universe uses time. Time, as we know it, is sort of our own making, but there's other ways of, you know, relative quantum physics kind of thing, right? And so he actually wasn't like, in a lab, you know, with beakers and, you know, creating things. He was thinking and imagining. That's what he was doing. He was imagining and thinking and using his intuitive mind for some of the most profound formulas that we know as humans. And it's just incredible and mind boggling to think that. Like he just sat there and went, Hmm, you know, <laughs> let me see. <laughs> so this is what we need to kind of develop is more of our intuitive side of our mind to learn to imagine, learn to visualize. And we're conditioned to put that aside and believe what we're seeing in front of us and believe what we're hearing and making that more sacred. Like, like I said, we live in a very antidotal way if we really look at ourselves. And yeah, I've heard from a friend that this, the la 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 la, but do we then, oh, I can imagine me having a good meal at this restaurant as opposed to having a meal that's laced with food poisoning. <laughs> now the natives for the medicine circle also have into intuition. So it starts to develop more so when we're on the west side in our adulthood that we need to develop our intuition and as we go to the north direction of the medicine circle that's when we become elders and if we've done things properly <laughs> that's not always the case but if we've done things properly and we're heading in the right directions our intuition as elders moves into being wisdom so, you know, think on that. Or as, as you move into your older years, is your intuition developing in to wisdom? So that's all I have to say today. I hope that gives you some food for thought, things to think about, and, you know, giving yourself a check-in. And where is my mind right now? Where is it when I react to a situation or a question that comes up? Or where is it when I'm setting my goals, when I'm journaling? Because right now is a very powerful time in June 2021. We have a new moon eclipse coming in. We're in Gemini with both Saturn and Mercury in retrograde. And we're coming up to the summer solstice, which is a very, very powerful time when portals open that are portals of abundance. So these are all things to kind of think about so that you can take the best advantage of the energy that is around us right now.
Okay, take care. Have a great day. Thank you so much for being here. Please share this with your friends if you have anyone that you think might like to see this. And please leave a comment below on what your thoughts are. And uh, subscribe and like the video. I appreciate all the support. Take care.